Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the third installment of Collier's COVID-19 webinar series. The focus today is on the office market across Canada and the various issues and challenges currently facing this asset class. I personally think it's a very unique topic because all of the moving parts within the office sector. I just wanna remind everybody that we will not be taking live questions today. However, if you do have questions, please type them in the Q&A section within Zoom and we will review them and answer them after the session. My name is Tim Locke. I'm a senior director within the Collier's Valuation Group in downtown Toronto, and I'll be your moderator today. Joining us, we have an excellent panel of industry experts, each of which are deeply immersed in all aspects of the office market right across the country. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to give you their long introduction. Rather, I'd refer you back to the registration page uh, where you signed up to read their short bio, or you can search them out online as well. But we'll do a short introduction now. Joining us today, we have John Duda, President, Collier's Real Estate Management Services, Canada, Peter McFarlane, Senior Vice President, Investment Operations, Fiera Real Estate, Colin Scarlett, Executive Vice President, Collier's Vancouver Office Leasing, and lastly, Chris Tambakis, CEO, Adgar Canada. Before we jump into the discussion, I just wanna briefly go over some national office market stats to get the ball rolling. I should point out that you may not be able to fully view the slides, so you may have to quickly minimize your Zoom screen. With the exception of Alberta, the office market is coming from a position of strength with good investment demand across most markets. 2019 sales volumes were roughly 10.3 billion across the country and overall investor appetite for both core product in downtown and suburban markets was relatively strong. As a result, key markets such as Montreal and Vancouver saw increases in year over year sales volumes. This trend had seemingly continued into the first quarter of 2020 as year to date sales indicated that well located assets with strong investment fundamentals continued to be sought after by investors. However, I should caution that most of these sale transactions were likely negotiated in late 2019 or early 2020 before the peak of the pandemic. Again, exclusive of Alberta, most major cities across the country experienced strong leasing fundamentals leading up to the shutdowns. This included low vacancy levels as a result of strong demand and absorption, and the national vacancy rate was sitting at about 8.1% at the end of Q1. Downtown markets within Canada fared even better. In Toronto and Vancouver, for example, vacancy levels have dipped to just 1.2 and 1.4% respectively. This officially makes them the tightest office markets in North America, a title that they've held since about mid 2019. This lack of availability coupled with continuing demand has also led to strong rental growth on a year over year basis in these markets. On the public market side, we saw almost all of the REITs have their share prices slashed in half towards the end of March. They've since rebounded slightly and now currently sit at about a 34% discount to the prices seen in late February. Also, rent collections have been fairly healthy with most REITs receiving at least 90% of rental amounts due last month. So with that out of the way, I'd like to get into our discussion with our panel members. So John, I'd like to start with you and following up from that last slide, it seems as though most of the concerns surrounding the impacts of COVID-19 on commercial real estate relate to rent collections and how well each asset class is keeping up. And your group recently completed a rent analysis across Collier's entire portfolio of managed properties. Would you mind giving us a brief high level overview of what you guys found within your analysis and maybe point out any trends in the office market that you saw? Sure, Tim, thanks. Uh, so we have about 8,600 tenants across the country, which is a mix of office, uh, retail and industrial and some other, uh, approximately 48% of that is office. Um, we surveyed our tenants, looked at risk, uh, the risk of these individual tenants and whether or not they, they asked for rent relief. Approximately 21% of tenants across the board asked for rent relief. Uh, the two factors that were overriding influencers on whether or not they would ask for rent relief. And this won't be of any surprise, I think, to anybody. Uh, number one factor is whether or not the business was completely closed. So if it was partially open, they were less likely to ask for rent relief. But if it was completely closed, it was the number one factor. 
the second uh, factor that, that rose to the surface was whether or not it was a small business. So medium and larger size businesses were less, far less likely to ask for rent relief. It was small business. The, there are two other factors that had a strong influence. Uh, the third was retail. And again, not really any surprise, uh, but retail, and if you look at um, uh, how retail operates in terms of uh, traffic, one retailer can affect another retailer as they attract business. So we saw uh, some retailers, again, it was more impactful on retailers. And the last factor that was influencing people, people's willingness to pay rent was whether or not they had access to any of the government assistance programs. Excellent. Um, John, did you see any differences when looking at specific asset location, perhaps downtown versus suburban markets, or maybe even markets in general, say like Montreal versus Toronto? Yes, there are some small differences, but they weren't huge. And um, for instance, uh, suburb, I'll call it rural. And for us, rural would be anything out, outside of a suburban uh, markets. Um, the, and I'm just reading some numbers off here. They were 18% more likely to ask for rent relief in a, in a rural market. Uh, so, sorry, sorry. Let me back up one minute. I'm reading the wrong line here. Rural, um, it was 45% more likely. It had a very wow. significant impact. And as you got closer, so suburban was at 22%, non-core, and this is again, the vast majority of this is office, was 19%, and core office was at 15%. So the closer you got to a core, and what we also looked at was the, we looked at the risk profile of those tenants, and essentially, and again, it may not be of much surprise to people, people that are located in good quality buildings in a core are typically solid tenants. Uh, ones that are outside of, of cities, they're taking uh, far less expensive space. They're typically smaller businesses and, and a little bit more higher risk. Yeah, that seems to make sense. Um, now looking forward to May and this month, what do some of these trends tell us about what we might see for May rent collections or even the longer term trend? Well, we're tracking uh, rent day by day and we're comparing it to the past six months. So how's each month been day by day and what it is now? So as it's tracking now today, we are 8% less in rent collection across the board than we were last month. And last month was 8% less than the month before. And that's on a like for like basis. So the thing we are noticing and because we're getting our managers to provide in, in inputs and feedback is that it is taking longer now. And we think that the pause going on has to do with the rent relief program offered by the government that simply doesn't have definition. And they're telling our managers that directly saying until that comes out, I'm just not paying my rent. Uh, and obviously that's not everybody. Um, so actually what we're seeing is a very similar trend from last month to this month, but we think it's just going to take a little bit longer to get uh, the rent because of the lack of clarity on the rent program. But we think at the end of the month, it will be very, very similar to the end of April. Okay. Very interesting. Certainly that rental relief will have an impact for sure. Um, Chris, I'd like to get your opinion and or sort of your input and uh, as to what you expect to happen in May with your own portfolio as it relates to rent collections and you know have you sort of highlighted any groups that are having problems what are you seeing in your portfolio so um, uh, thank you for the question it's an excellent one and John those are great statistics um, so uh, we'll be we'll be speaking about those statistics later um, <laughs> for sure in, in our portfolio, um, we have about a third, a third, and a third, a third international businesses, a third national businesses, and a third local. And I wouldn't even bifurcate those by urban and suburban. I could say that would apply across our entire portfolio. Um, so we would have international companies in our suburban portfolio as much as we do in downtown and vice versa with small businesses, local businesses. Um, 
we started tracking this back in January when the COVID outbreak started in China. And we started looking at who our tenants were and where the risks might be um, and trying to categorize each of the tenants. Um, and, and then sort of sat back and, and said, all right, what categories do we think might have trouble or, or might experience some issues? Again, by their size, type of industry they're in, and so on. Um, I would tell you as much as we tracked it fairly well and made our assumption, you know, pretty good assumptions, there were surprises. There were things that we didn't expect that surfaced. Um, and I would say, you know, reflecting on John's comments, some of those became calls because it was a small business, but we wouldn't have put it in the category of requiring help because we would have thought that that business would not require help. Instead, that actually, that owner reached out and asked for help. So uh, our numbers aren't probably entirely representative of the suburban urban comment that John made. Um, the rural doesn't apply to us uh, at all, but, but the, uh, for us, I would tell you, we had just as many urban tenants that were small businesses that would have asked as much as in the, in the suburbs. Um, as far as, as uh, particular categories, I sort of look at it a different way without picking on, on specific names. There are businesses that closed and will continue to suffer post COVID like travel. So travel is not going to happen tomorrow. Uh, planes aren't going to be flying, borders are closed. And so we're expecting those businesses to suffer greater than others. There are other businesses that closed and will catch up. Professional firms, if they closed or had to as a dentist, for instance, a dentist will likely catch up, not maybe all of his patient visits, but many of his patient visits. And then you have businesses that stopped, and this really categorizes into the retail area. No one's coming in and ordering the sandwich they didn't order the week before. So that's businesses gone, but those people and those businesses will likely rebound relatively quickly depending on the volume of traffic that comes by their, their locations, principally driven by the office buildings in the area. And then we had a whole category of people that are doing just fine. And uh, I don't want to say anyone's doing great, but they're doing fine. And they've adapted to the circumstances. Their businesses are having to pivot, um, obviously, with a lot of, uh, across a lot of things, but they're, they're doing fine. As far as rent collections go, our numbers would be close to what uh, John has said. Um, but but I'm, I'm curious in John's number, our number is again around that 10%, um, you know, upwards of 10%, but we worked with our tenants at the outset. We started working with our tenants in March. And so we expected a certain amount of slippage, if you will, um, that ranged in that eight to 10% number. And we also are expecting that for May based on how we've structured our approach to working with our tenants. Uh, and of course that could go forward. Um, it could go forward into June and July. I'd also like to comment that I think John's comment is right. The rent uh, program that has been announced is, I mean, it's no secret, everybody knows it's very unclear, very confusing, um, and still not even defined um, in, in many aspects of the program for tenants and, and landlords. So that has caused some unusual behavior with tenants this month. Uh, but we kind of expected it because we knew it was coming. For sure. Um, Peter, I'd like to jump to you now. How is Fierre's portfolio, portfolio looking for the month of May? What do you expect rent collections to look like? And do you echo most of the comments that Chris just mentioned? Yeah, I, I'll add on to that. And maybe I'll just start with, with a bit of a, a summary of what, what, ha what we have and, and what happened in April. So we have about 1,250 tenants, um, re, you know, commercial tenants across Canada, another eight, eight or 900 residential tenants, so about 2,000. Um, we were thinking that, you know, rent collections would, you know, we we're bracing for the worst. In reality, it, it surprised us to the upside in terms of our forecasts and our models for April. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're over 97% on the residential uh, we're over 90% on our, our office and industrial collection and our retail collection is, is um, around 70%. So that's, that's by far the worst. Um, our expectation for, um, you know, the month of May is, is a deterioration of those numbers, uh, particularly in the residential. Um, the retail, I would think, I hope is a little bit more static 
um, because our, our retail is, is mostly open air. Um, and in terms of our office, there may be some deterioration as well, uh, but should continue at, at those numbers is our expectation for, for May. Um, and, you know, we are seeing parts of the country start to, to talk about opening up in, in BC. Um, we're seeing some of that talk. So some of the businesses may return to their, their places of work. Um, and Quebec has, has also loosened. Um, so hopefully, hopefully in June and July, um, you know, our, our numbers start to bottom out and, and begin to improve. But I think for the short term, we're in, we're in for some more deterioration. For sure. So Peter, sticking with you, I just want to jump back to a point that Chris mentioned um, about actively working with their tenants. Um, have you guys done a similar approach in terms of working with your tenants who are struggling? What have you done? Yeah, so with our, with our retail tenants, we, we did a cross the board two month deferral program for all those uh, smaller tenants that were applicable. Um, in terms of our office portfolio specifically, we've gone case by case. It's less of a programmatic approach. Um, so we've, we've negotiated with those because the numbers were less where we were able to take that approach. I think going forward, the real uh, challenge is no one knows the duration of this <laughs> crisis of this event. So it doesn't, it starts to not make sense to put in lease amendments, deferral agreements without knowing the duration. Um, so for some select tenants, we're, we're working on a, uh, a program whereby their their AR balances continue to build. We try to we try to get them to pay what they can, um, and then whenever this event ends, um, that'll be the the point to negotiate. Um, because right now, um, it it can just be incredibly frustrating negotiating every couple months uh, as the situation evolves, and and there's a lot of time with 1,250 tenants. It's you know you can't take that type of approach. Um, so those are, those are some of the highlights from, from our program. For sure. John, how about you guys? What are you doing with your, your office portfolio and how you're managing struggling tenants? Uh, well, I, I think, again, the office uh, sector has been the least impacted or very close to industrial. Um, you know, I mean, we're more of a conduit between the owner and, and the tenant as it relent, re, relates to um, deferrals. So both uh, Peter and, and Chris are clients of, of mine and they're great clients, um, but uh, they, uh, you know, they, they are the ones actually uh, giving us guidance on, on the uh, packages and whether or not a deferral is, is the way to go. Fair enough. So on that, if you want, I can just feed into what uh, Peter said and, and uh, what John's group is doing with us. Um, we took a, you know, we have hundreds of tenants that have approached us as well. And uh, we took it upon ourselves to communicate with every single tenant, um, both in writing and then by call, which was a Herculean uh, task for our team. And uh, these are not short calls, uh, they're long calls. And, and what we found in those conversations were people that were just reaching out to find out what could they do and people that really needed help. And when we talked to people and we explained to them, you know, first of all, we're not a bank. None of us are banks as landlords, but we were doing our best to help those that needed the help the most. Um, I want to give a shout out to a number of our tenants who stepped up and said, you know what? I can, I can, I can, we, our business will be fine. I don't need help. Um, it'll be a little tight, but we'll manage and we'll be okay. And that allowed us to do a whole lot more for a lot of other people who, quite frankly, were worried about putting bread on the table or a roof over their head. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I'm very thankful for how our tenants have responded to, to our program. Um, we decided to put a program in right at the beginning to give our tenants some runway, not knowing how long this is going to last. We wanted to say to see some people, okay, here's, the next couple of months and then here's the next couple of months and here's what the next couple of months look like or the balance of this year. And, and that was very, very well received by people because it allowed them to at least take a deep breath and say, okay, I've, I've dealt with this. Um, and this is, this has been fantastic. So again, it was a very positive response from people. Our expectation and it's played out was that those that we helped 
for April with a roadmap and asked others to wait, maybe see what goes on as this thing evolves. We've helped people in May and we're likely gonna be asked to help people in June. So it will grow um, and it will have its limits as to how much it can grow. But hopefully as the economy opens up, um, some of the things that have been closed, whether they be doctors or dentists or lawyers offices, um, some of which can still be working remotely like lawyers, um, that pressure will come off and that maybe will allow us to help the other office tenants, uh, again, more in the small sector. I should also say uh, to John and his team, uh, that they they were amazing in helping administer this because while we had the conversations with tenants and and had those one on ones we then did document it but we didn't go through lease amendings we just did a simple two pager deferral agreement and and the uh, the team at Collier's just executed that uh, fabulously with us so it was great excellent thank you Chris Colin thanks for being patient um, want to jump over to the leasing side of things now. What are you seeing or hearing in your market from tenants, landlords? What types of challenges or issues are they facing? And I mean, are deals getting done at all or is everything just essentially being put on pause? And you know, if deals are being done, is there any downward pressure on rents yet? Yeah, lots of questions in there. Um, as you can tell from my, from my, <laughs> so you can tell from my background, mostly just to remind Chris how beautiful the weather is in Vancouver, um, which is where I'm from. Um, you know, the, the, it, was snowing, uh, it was snowing in Ontario today, by the way. But yeah, think, yeah. That's, that's why this background's up, Chris. Uh, <laughs> and so, so just to remind the audience, you know, my, my background is I'm a, I'm a tenant rep broker. So I view the world through that lens. So, so you can keep that in mind. You know, we've seen, we've seen in, in the discussions that I've had with, with landlords, and I've been doing this for 24 years. So the, I've had some deep conversations with landlords and tenants. And there's, there's a public voice from landlords. There's also a private voice. And so the public voice has been, you know, mostly pretty firm, which is to pay your rent. The private voice is we don't want the space back because right now what we're finding is there is no bid. Like we can't get an offer on the vast majority of space. So what space works if you can't have, if, if there's no bid. So, you know, when push comes to shove, most landlords are, are doing their best. I think the tenants who are having the greatest level of success are those that can demonstrate true hardship. And there have been some egregious examples. And John and I had a couple, had a conversation earlier this week. And if you knew some of the requests that have been made, your eyes would pop out of your head. So, you know, that's, that's one of the things I think people are, um, are really, uh, are really thinking about, but um, you know, do we have downward pressure on rents? It's really hard to tell every conversation we're having with landlords when they're quoting rents, they're quoting, okay, well, the rent is X, uh, but it's, that's the pre, that's the pre COVID rent. Okay. Well, what's the post COVID rent? I have, I don't know. I have no idea. No, no one's answering that question mostly because nobody really knows. Um, have we seen deals die? I've got, a, I've got one deal that actually died that will likely never come back. The rest are all postponed. So leases always expire. I think that I'm, I think my wife might, might leave me later in the year because of how busy I'll be on all of this pent up demand. So you know, I think that there will be a difference and I'm happy to speak to kind of Vancouver's dynamics. Uh, I think Tim, you wanted to talk about that later, but, um, but I think that everybody's just trying to figure out how to get out of this um, and weather the storm sooner than, sooner than later. For sure, for sure. Um, Peter, on the landlord side, what are you guys seeing in terms of uh, maybe renewals that are getting done? Are you still hitting your NERs? Um, are you giving out large TI packages to entice tenants or um, what's going on from the landlord perspective? Yeah, I just add on to Colin's comments there. Um, I think that there's, the, the, you know, the new leasing market has completely dried up, um, but, you know, leases do come due. And so we have been doing renewals. Um, the new leasing that we have done, I, I describe as pandemic leasing. So government agencies needing sort of shorter term space for storage, uh, reactionary leasing, but that's, that's in the minority. The majority of our lease activity is all about renewals. And I'd say de definitely our tenant base has become a, a lot more conservative. So where before we might see expansions, relocations, it's, it's just contracted to, um, you know, renewal as is. 
on on the rate discussion we haven't seen any movement yet on the on the face rates uh, on the net rates but what we have seen change is um you know uh the 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 ti's and the terms so the the duration of the renewals has shrunk uh from five ten year renewals now you know the few renewals that have gone through our system have been shorter in duration you know one year two years three years uh, and the TI packages have obviously uh, dropped off uh, commensurately. So, you know, no TI, limited TI, um, just sort of stay in place. Uh, so the NERs are actually decent, um, but I, I don't know if that's really a true, you know, reflection of what the market will be in a few months from now. For sure. Yeah, that's, that's a fair point. Uh, Chris, I don't know if you wanted to add to that at all. Um, are you pretty much the same thing? I, I, I just, uh, yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's a mixed bag. Uh, you know, for new deals, there have been few. We've, we've actually had some traffic as of late, which is a little surprising. Um, I wouldn't call it COVID traffic either. Uh, what that ends up turning into and looking like, we'll see. But, but we have had some deals um, that, uh, that have all of a sudden people have shown up needing some space, looking for some space. So that's been uh, encouraging, but but certainly not, I would say, anywhere near the type of velocity that we were all experiencing pre this. Um, on renewals, there's a few that are getting done, but but we're also finding, and we've been proactive in the tenants, with the tenants saying, how about we just push this down six months? Um, somebody whose renewal is coming up, you know, people are actually looking for time right now because they don't know. They don't know what's going on. And we don't want the space back like anybody else, right? And they don't want to lose their office necessarily either. And so in that instance, we're, we're actually just being mindful of, of pushing it off. Um, and, then, and then, you know, we had some pending deals that were just on the edge of getting done. And it was a mixed bag as well. One killed, done, finished, gone, may come back. And the other one, they just asked for more time to see how this is all playing out. Maybe they need a little more space, a little less space. They're not sure. Um, one thing that's a theme though through all of this, and, and Peter, I'm sure you're feeling the same way. Um, we absolutely are, are like when we're doing deferrals and so on, no interest, no penalty. When we're talking to tenants about pushing out dates, we're not leveraging it into, you know, give me a dollar later here now and these conversations. This is about doing the right thing at this time with people to make all of us get through this together. And so tenants have responded very well to that as well. Uh, despite what we hear in the media about, you know, landlords not doing things and this and that, I think the majority of landlords are actually behaving pretty decently and, and I think trying to do the right thing. Um, certainly our peer groups, I, I believe that's the case. And John, I bet you'd say that across the board for your, for your clients. Yeah, I think there it's, it's in the interest of both the landlord and the tenant to deal with true issues. Uh, and and they're, I think they're all doing that consistently across the board. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, that, that makes yeah. sense. Sorry, I'll just make one other comment that halfway through last month, there were a handful of landlords that were not willing to negotiate at all. And we saw rent collection drop off completely. Um, and by the end of the month, they did you know, they saw what was happening, rebounded very quickly and came to agreements and things uh, smoothed out. As, as far as where rents are and, and NERs and stuff, Tim, there isn't enough inputs. Like, we don't know, we don't know, companies are, I'm, I'm finding most companies, they don't know what they're doing, it's because they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know what is gonna, it's gonna look like. Um, they don't know what the recession will look like coming out of this, how deep, how, how long, or if there will be one, um, they don't know what their industry is doing and, and those types of changes. And there's a whole pile of other things. So it's too early to tell on, on uh, where rents and ERs are. I think it will be a lot more conservative from the tenant side though, in terms of you know, growth or, and, and you know, building offices this way and that way and doing all sorts of things. I think, I think conservatism will probably come to the table. For sure. I think um, that's an interesting comment because I was, I was on a call with, Colliers China, and they were describing the back to work environment. They described industrial office and retail. Um, you know, the general comment about office was that people came back, they're back 100%. But any expansion plans, just in general, expansion plans were canceled. 
Uh, on the retail side, they've seen a very significant pop in the first couple of months and, and they're, they've got a name for it, revenge shopping. People are <laughs> desperate to come out again. Uh, they said the, the traffic in malls. That's actually what Colin's wife does. I think that, 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 that wasn't he talking about that earlier? <laughs> speaking of, speaking <laughs> of Colin, guys, I want to jump back to Colin for a second. Um, yeah, Colin, Chris. the Vancouver market is obviously super tight, um, very low vacancy rate. At what point do you think vacancy rates have to increase enough to maybe see some downward pressure on rents or, or to halt rental growth completely? You know, it's it, to make a general, the problem is to make a general statement versus specific statement. So what we're seeing is some landlords have been very good at keeping their vacancy rates really low. So we're actually, your chart was hugely wrong, Tim. Instead of 1.4% vacancy, we're 1.3% vacant. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's so tight. Um, and, you know, for us to go from a 1.3% vacancy rate to a 5% vacancy rate downtown, we have to add 1.15 million square feet to the market, which is call it three towers. And to do that with business failures is gonna be really tough. Um, we were on a call this morning, there's a couple of subleases coming to the, to the market, but there'd have to be a tremendous number of business failures. And at a 5% vacancy rate, it's still a landlord's market. So I think what we're gonna see is those landlords who have vacant, unimproved space, they're in trouble. Because I believe strongly that, that there's gonna be a scare, there is a scarcity of capital and even if there isn't a scarcity of capital within a company, they're not spending it on walls, paint, carpet. They're going to spend it on other things. So if you as a landlord have, have improved space, the liquidity of that space is going, to be, is, is going to be dramatically better. And I think we're going to, when we look back on this, we're going to see days on market of space. We're going to see a difference between the two of those. Um, and then there will be, of course, some landlords who will become, you know, will have to be a bit more desperate because they have one tenant who left 50% of the property is, is vacant and they're going to have to be a bit more, um, you know, a bit more, um, uh, you know, aggressive on, on what their rents are going to be. Others can keep going for it. Like, and keep in mind, we also have just come off of one of the highest rents Vancouver has ever seen. We just, we hit one deal hit $70 a foot. So, you know, if we move from 70 to 60, 50, like, does it, you know, I don't think, I think everybody has to keep this in mind. The other challenge I think is, um, I think, you know, from a, if a tenant goes to their board to try and renew a lease at $60 a foot or $50 a foot in this economic climate, um, the senior executives are going to get, you know, they're going to get their hands slapped. I think we, I think landlords are going to have to be very sensitive when they're having discussions with tenants about the, about where rates were, where they're going, um, understanding that there's a tremendous number of people who are, are going to be, uh, are going to have a very difficult time pushing through rents, whether, you know, wh- regardless of what the market is at, at some of these market highs, knowing that they're still struggling to bring people back and they don't have, a, and there's a lack of capital. And there will be a, a list of haves and have nots. For sure. Thanks, Colin. Appreciate that. Um, so as Chris and John pointed out earlier in some of their discussions, obviously tenants are going to be very cautious with growth or expansions, um, obviously as a result of the social distancing is placed on their businesses. But I'm curious to know from all of you, is there maybe a particular industry or sector within the, the office space where you guys could see some either near-term growth or, or medium-term growth? Maybe I'll yeah. start Peter. Yeah, sure. I I think I, like it's it's probably too er- early to tell, but if you want to, if I had to take a guess, and there's two competing forces here because, you know, the the tech the tech business I think is just doing, you know, for, for the most part, uh, well because of this this crisis, and many of the tenants in Collins Market may benefit because of the infrastructure that we're relying on. For instance, right now for this meeting. Uh, is benefiting, you know, tech companies. So, you know, I think tech will continue to do well. The counterbalance to that is now we've all learned to work remotely. So even if it does well, do those companies actually take more physical space in our buildings or, or does their footprint begin to shrink? Um, And then at the same time, you have physical distancing measures that you know, maybe we need 30% more space. So there's, there's too many factors to determine which factor is the winner. Um, but I would still bet that that tech's going to do, 
looking to do well in the, in the short term. And I'd add to Peter's comment, you know, we've seen uh, the Vancouver example, and just to throw some stats at you, the, the average tech company um, spends, you know, three, the, the average company spends three to 6% of their, their overall overhead on office space. Uh, 60 to 80% of that is on labor, right? So Vancouver is the ninth most expensive office market in North America, but we're the 36th most expensive labor market in North America in US dollar equivalents. So do you overpay for office space to get, to, to get accessible labor and less expensive labor? My suggestion is yes. And I think that the fundamentals in places like Vancouver and Toronto are going to, uh, will, will remain solid. Um, and, and tech, you know, we've seen Amazon just leased in the middle of the COVID, they just leased 80,000 square feet downtown Vancouver. There's another rumored requirement for 500,000 square feet. And there's another major U.S. tech company looking for 200,000 square feet downtown, which would basically wipe up all of our new supply. So, you know, the advantage is, is um, you know, there's a handful of local tech companies who are profitable, who are being able to hire more today than they have in the past, which is a positive. The negative is, you know, how do you compete with Amazon and Microsoft and Salesforce and all these huge U.S. firms? Uh, so th I think it's created a have the haves and the have nots, certainly in our market, and I would suspect in other markets as well. But but tech, tech for sure, tech is the vast majority of the, de the demand. They're the largest segment of demand in Vancouver have been for a number of years, and they're the ones who are going to drive us out of this uh, more and more for sure, in my opinion. So, okay, so tech and tech. Chris, do you, do you agree tech is gonna take us out in Toronto as well or? So, so tech has been the, the fastest growing piece of the office market in Toronto, um, for sure. And probably across the country for the most part. Um, I think there's two types of tech. There's established tech and there's startup tech. And I seem to have a memory back to the early tech days of 2000 when we had tech going like crazy, extra floors, extra space, but it was capital constrained. And when the capital dried up, it was gone. So I think you have to bifurcate the tech market and say how much of your market is driven by, you know, the sales forces, the Amazons, et cetera. And how much is it driven by the small startups or the startups? And what does that mean to your market? Um, I would say, you know, when, when an elephant comes in and takes, 100,000, 200, 300, 400,000 feet, it makes a huge difference. But when you take a bunch of tech companies across the entire market and you say, okay, all of a sudden their capital sources are, are, have dried up and they're not profitable yet, what does that mean for um, you know, the, 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 the office space they've rented or for the shared office facilities they're in, whether it be a Spaces or a WeWork? So I think tech is going to be very active but I think there's going to be the haves and have nots, Colin, as you've said it. I also just want to quickly comment about the country. Um, you know, Vancouver and Toronto are in a great position as we move through this COVID and as we come out of it. So, you know, Colin gave some great statistics about what it would mean for vacancy to go up and shift from tenant, from landlord to tenant. The same metrics would apply for Toronto, uh, even if you take the GTA number versus the downtown number. Um, but then you've got cities like Calgary and Calgary isn't just dealing with COVID. Calgary is dealing with a much larger problem, um, obviously the oil and gas industry and its issues are going to survive well past this. Uh, and so I'm not sure that the country will behave, um, you know, across the board that we'll see, we'll see behavior that'll be consistent, you know, Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto, Vancouver, Winnipeg, et cetera. Um, it will be, it, there will be winners and, and strugglers uh, coming out of this. Um, and those that were struggling to start with, this is not helping and it's gonna make it worse. For sure. Thanks, Chris. Thank you for the insights on Calgary as well. Um, I wanna switch gears now a little bit. I wanna get into the actual valuation of uh, office properties. Um, so just to rewind a little bit, you know, by the time social distancing really took effect in Canada, we were essentially only two weeks away from Q1 reporting period. Um, and without any empirical evidence, nobody really knew the extent of the impacts at that time. And, you know, to be fair, we may still not know the impacts. Um, but what I'm interested to know is, is where you might see changes in terms of your, your internal valuations or external valuations. What are your internal teams or external appraisers tweaking in terms of 
um, assumptions? Are they changing renewal probabilities, vacancy allowances? Are they changing cap rates, like going in cap rates, terminal cap rates, discount rates? Where do you think we're going to see the changes in Q2? Peter, maybe you could start us off? Yeah. Yeah. So first off, first of all, um, we on valuation, we've tried to be um, the most aggressive to the downside. And, and that may seem strange. Uh, but the first thing we did was we switched on our on our biggest fund. We have a number of different funds. Our core fund, we switched it to monthly valuation um, to ensure the most accurate values for our investors. And marking, you know, marking to that greatest accuracy is important, uh, and we'll continue to do that every every month. Um, but but the the real problem, which you alluded to, Tim, is that there's you know there's not many data points. So. How can you change cap rates when there's been no trades? Uh, how can you change discount rates, you know, uh, and those kind of metrics? And, and, and so far, we've seen our external appraisers not shift those, uh, by and large, except, except in Alberta, which, which is, um, I think, seeing continued deterioration. But where we've really seen the change in assumptions in our models is uh, longer lease-up periods, uh, a bad debt reserve put in, um, you know, uh, longer, longer lease up time. So all the uh, lower inflation numbers, all, all the sort of income oriented uh, assumptions have deteriorated. Um, but, but those assumptions, they hit our models and they, they account for some decrease in value. They're not as impactful as those, those cap rate uh, assumptions. And, um, you know, I'd expect that maybe by July, August, we start to see some trading, presumably, uh, and, and at that point, our appraisers uh, can take that into account. For sure. Chris, I appreciate this is probably a question you'd ask me normally, but do you have an opinion on some of the metrics that might change? I'm glad you recognize that. And not, <laughs> we'll be asking you at some point in the balance of this year, as you know. Um, so I think there's no data points yet that can give us a direction for Q2. I think the real question is about what's Q4 look like. And, and that's, you know, and that will have way more data, way more uh, runway in terms of what the economy is going to look like coming out of this. Are we past COVID? Do we see, a, you know, is there another train in the tunnel or is it really light at the end of the tunnel? So Q, Q1, there was nothing to speak to. Q2, we'll tinker with things, but I think it'd be more case by case on a building basis rather than just a broad stroke saying that cap rates are here or market rents have moved there. If you have a particular building that's got obviously a significant vacancy now, your lease up is going to be longer. And so that may, you know, that would be a, a, a specific situation for a particular building as opposed to at this point having broad, uh, broad market changes. Um, that's, that's my thinking, although we'll know, you know, we'll know more the next 30 days could change that too. Right. For sure. Um, but I, but I think, you know, I'm sort of looking, uh, what's, what's Q4 look like? What's 21 look like? Um, and, and, uh, and that to me is how we approach it. We don't do monthlies. In fact, we try and do annuals, but we are now doing semis and okay, occasionally, as is the case now, we're doing quarterly. Um, reviews of our value. And that's, the, that's, that's been generally the consensus that we're hearing. For sure, yeah. I would agree with most of those points both of you made. Um, now, just breaking it down even further, so certain income streams within office buildings um, are non-existent right now. For example, parking is not happening. Um, retail tenants are, I assume most of them are, are shut down right now. Um, how are you guys looking at those particular income streams as they relate to the overall value of your office assets? Yeah, Peter? I think it's, yeah, I think it's this, it's in some ways it's similar to how we're projecting the, the change in our vacant units or, or the lease up assumptions. It's, it's, uh, a delay in the, you know, in the, in the rebound of them. I can say, you know, the, the parking revenue and the ancillary revenue, um, that's, that's maybe daily, um, you know, in terms of the contracts we have has disappeared, as you've said. Um, so we're not taking that into account that that's <laughs> occurring right now, obviously in our forecasting. Um, and, you know, we're just being cautious about how we, how we forecast that in, into the future, but yeah, it, it is non-existent and it's just the nature of that type of revenue 
fortunately for most office buildings, it tends to be a, a, a more minor piece of your revenue stream. Um, and, and that's just, you know, kind of the nature of most of the buildings we have. So for, sure. for us, yeah, for us, our urban buildings, um, I expect that, well, parking is, is non-existent now and we don't do a lot of visitor parking in all of our buildings. It's mostly tenant driven. Um, although we do have some component in, in our urban buildings, uh, for instance, up on Eglinton, we've got visitor parking. Uh, I expect those will bounce back very quickly because tenants that come to work, the pipe, the, the obstacle to come to work isn't your workspace right now, it's transit. That's where people are going to be having a hard time socially distancing. Um, Toronto's transit system accommodates about 1.5 million riders a day, if I recall my statistics correctly. We're operating at about 600,000 now. So if, if people all of a sudden, that doubles, and it's tough to do the, the, the uh, distancing at 600,000, if that doubles and goes to 1.2 million, it's an impossibility. The city's already making changes with roadways, bike lanes, et cetera, to try and ease that. And companies are going to make people come in on phase basis. And so there'll, there'll be an easing of that, but people will also choose to drive. So I think that that person that is, uh, has a car available to them will drive when they may not have in the past. They may have taken transit for a lot of reasons, including commute time in a car versus, versus transit. So I'm expecting that our, our, our tenant parking will rebound nicely um, and the usage might actually find itself under pressure a little bit, maybe, uh, as occupancy increases. Um, in the suburban markets where we have either have free parking or, or it's a lower cost, um, again, people that are either uh, coming by transit or otherwise, there'll probably be more people wanting to drive and park than, than take transit just because of the COVID issue. Um, and then it'll level off. When we get past this, it'll get back to normal. So from a valuation point of view, this is a moment in time when it comes to parking. Um, if our buildings go 20% vacant because the market turns south and that's where vacancy is in Toronto, then it becomes more measurable. But I don't think we're heading down that road. Yeah, and I, just, I just add to that comment that we're seeing more um, activity and I think the activity rebounds will be a little bit faster in the suburbs. Because, yeah. because of what Chris said, right? There, there's more people get to those suburban buildings with cars. Yeah, definitely, yeah, that makes sense. Peter, um, I wanna shift focus again a little bit now. So in terms of actual investment, uh, your portfolios are very diversified. Uh, I mean, you mainly invest in all the major asset classes, but in terms of office right now, are you a buyer of office product? And if so, maybe you could tell me exactly what you have your eyes on. Hmm. Well, I mean, generally the, in the investment market from what we've seen is frozen. <laughs> so um, if there was, if there was deals would be a, be a buyer. Yes. Um, it, it, you know, but there is no, there's literally no, no deals that, uh, that are out there by and large. Um, so I, I would say our, our first bucket probably remains industrial, but our second bucket would be office uh, right behind that. Um, so yeah, we're still interested in the space, uh, and, and would continue to add to, add to our positions as we build our portfolio. Um, and you know, where we do that, I think is where we would, we did it before is, you know, transit oriented or, um, you know, urban, urban office office that we think is, you know, is good for the, the long term. Um, we also like office that has. Uh, sort of unique features with with tenants who have um, you know uh, longer staying power. Um, so um, we we own Aero Center right right around uh, Pearson Airport, and we own uh, AEP right around the Vancouver Airport. Uh, we still like those positions. Excellent, Chris. Now you you guys only invest in office, so maybe touch on what particular markets you might look at again, if assuming there were deals in the market. Well, I just want, it's funny, I'm, I'm curious what uh, Peter's definition of deals is. Did he mean transactions, available property, or did he mean something's a real deal that he thinks he can get at a deal? Uh, just, 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 an actual, just an actual trade. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, listen, our thesis is office, that's the business we're in, and, and um, we will carry on with what we do, which is urban and urban suburban. Um, 
and, and you know, in that sort of B, B plus, A minus uh, category. That's our space. That's what we specialize in. And that's where we think we can deliver the best value, um, not only in the particular building, but across the whole portfolio. Um, so we, we look at our business in that context, um, very much of a node approach. Um, and it's and it served us well, and I think it serves our tenant base well. Um, and and so we'll st we're sticking with that thesis. Uh, you won't see us moving to uh, retail or industrial or any any other categories. It's just not our, our business. As far as geography, um, you know, I've always tried to buy in Vancouver. Every time I tried to, something's too expensive, and then I kick myself because I should have bought it because it was cheaper before than it is now. So, so uh, you know, we look at Vancouver once in a while, but it, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, uh, doesn't, it's not something that we've act, been active involved, actively involved in. And, and Alberta, um, for us, we're long-term owners and I find Alberta is a little more of a trader's portfolio. And so it doesn't really suit us. Um, will we look beyond Toronto? Uh, we were in Montreal and, and, and Ottawa at one point. We may go back into those markets. Uh, we may also look back in the United States. Um, I think my message to you though is that we have great confidence in the office market long term. Uh, there will be bumps in the short term for sure. Uh, and there will be trends that come up for sure. But long term, we're, we're believers in it, uh, not only here in Canada, but in Israel, Poland and Belgium, where we have uh, good sized businesses. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. Um, John, jumping back to you. So obviously, governments and municipalities around the country are now coming out with their uh, back to work plans and, and easement of restrictions. Um, I'd like to get a sense of what that actually looks like when people start going back to work from your perspective. Um, can you maybe touch on, you know, what we might expect to see when this actually happens? Uh, definitely. So we're about, we got our plans ready, the master plans, and I'll, I'll put it in the context of about 80% ready because the, the, the final 20% is really going to depend upon how the government treats back to work and any kind of restrictions that might be in place. But the things you can expect is uh, distancing. There's going to be a theme of distancing, getting into a building, getting out of a building, particularly an office where there's density. Uh, another uh, aspect to this is face masks. They're, they're being talked about everywhere. Uh, some landlords are telling us they're going to require it uh, just to walk in their lobby and they will turn people away it, unless you have one walking into the lobby. I don't think we're going to have that, uh, that type of, of absolute measure. Um, there's going to be more cleaning, uh, absolutely. Um, there are some landlords that are demanding that we put in thermal scanning, uh, but right now we're not even sure Legally, we can do that here um, because it's a privacy issue. So if the government mandates it, we, we can. Um, one of the concerns we have for office buildings is elevators. So if you, if you look at restricting, say, four people to an elevator where there was eight before um, that could get in, you're you would have wait times anywhere from two to three hours if that building becomes full. So our actual bigger concern is around elevators and getting people in and out of the buildings. So right now, this is a, we're going through collecting, we're asking tenants for, for plans, their, their return to work plans. We're gonna have to try and gauge how many people are in the building or coming to the building, and then we're gonna have to alter plans um, to make sure we're, we're getting them in efficiently and getting them out efficiently. But it's probably the biggest concern uh, from a, 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 I guess, a practical perspective. It's more about getting them in and out than the actual protection. Uh, I think we'll have plans in place that'll make people feel comfortable. It's gonna be very obvious. There's gonna be signage, uh, there's gonna be masks, there's gonna be distancing, there's gonna be tape on floors. Um, and could be some additional measures. Um, but it, I honestly, we're more worried about the elevators than anything else. That makes sense, that makes sense. Um, Colin, very quickly, I wanna jump to you. Now you've traveled all over the world, been to countless cities to actually look at different office designs and spaces. 
Um, I'm curious what you think the future holds for office space in terms of design and functionality from, from your perspective and what you've seen in other countries. Yeah, you know, I think at the end of the day, it's uh, the conversations continues to revolve around the employee. And so the biggest challenge that a lot of employers face is trying to find quality labor. And so at the end of the day, that's, that should be the focus. Um, right now, the, call, the, the focus is on trying to bring people back to work and make sure the employees feel safe. And so that's the responsibility of the landlord. And it's also the responsibility of the, uh, of the, of the company, in my opinion, once we're past this, I do think people have short term memories. And so if we can find a, a vaccine, you know, in two years from now, this might all be, you know, gone the way, you know, the way of the dodo bird, at least I'm hoping so. So it's, it's a question of how, as a landlord, can you focus on making a building more appealing from a tenant's perspective? And then as an employer, how, how can you do that? Um, you know, working from home, Collier's interviewed, we surveyed 4,000 people globally. What we learned was that 65% of people don't have a home office. They're literally working in their kitchen. If you have a conference call with somebody after 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning, they're probably rubbing a535 on their back because their their back hurts so much from sitting at their at their table their their kitchen table what we learned was that there are you know large number of people who want the option to work from home a day a week couple days a week but only 10 percent of people actually want to work from home five days a week and so i do think that the office is is not going anywhere i think safety security is going to be really important um, I think this has pushed us to really think about technology. Uh, you know, can you work a couple days from home? If that's the case, what does that mean as an employer uh, to do hoteling? You know, you're going to have to really work on your cleaning standards. What are the cleaning standards? John can speak to that. And there's probably going to be an increasing number of, of global standards of level of cleanliness that people will have to do. Does you, you know, as, a, as someone who sits in a hotel desk for, the first three hours of the day, am I responsible for cleaning that desk? How does the next person know I've cleaned it appropriately? But I think it's still a people conversation. And then there's this capital, scarcity capital. I just think there's gonna be a scarcity capital. So where as an employer do you put your money? How as a landlord do you get really creative trying to uh, assist companies with that capital discussion? How creative can you be when you do a real estate deal in order to ensure that they're, um, uh, that there is a capital av available. Um, sure. and, and then there's, there's also the question around, you know, if as an employer to, to what extent does an employer subsidize, uh, uh, there, there are people who, who work from home. I am sitting at a, de a sit stand desk. I've got a huge monitor. I've got a printer, a scanner. I've got an ergonom ergonomical chair. Not everybody has that. And in order for to be, for me to be productive, I'm, I'm good, but there's lots of people that aren't. And so, Will, will, I do believe companies, you'll see companies invest in, um, in their employees and provide a, a credit, a tech credit, a furniture credit that they can go and spend on something that they can invest in their, uh, put in their office or in, the, in, the, in, in their home office or in their home somewhere. For sure. Uh, I want to just cut you off there, Colin. Sorry, we don't have a whole lot of time left. And there's one more question that I actually really want to get to. Um, it's for the entire panel. Now, I think, Peter, you alluded to this earlier, but there's essentially two forces pulling on each other here. Um, and one question that I keep hearing coming up every time I talk about the office market, and that's the need for social distancing within office spaces going forward versus work from home and how that factors into office demand. So what I'd like to get from each, is, each of you is uh, your opinion as to whether or not demand increases because of the need for social distancing within office space or if demand decreases because we're gonna see this, you know, influx of people working from home right now. And again, I remind you, we don't have a lot of time, so maybe seconds from each of you. Colin, I'll yeah. talk to you again. Yeah, I think short term, we're gonna see, if the, I think we're gonna see increased occupancy of the, of the space, despite the fact people are still gonna be working from home. Colliers, we're gonna be at about a 30% occupancy for the foreseeable future. Amazon, I've just heard from a friend uh, there in Vancouver, if you can work from home until October, they want you to. Same was Microsoft. So, you know, I think that occupancy levels are going to be, we're going to be spacing furniture out or else we're just not, lots of people will not be in the office. But as we come back, they, you know, I've heard from somebody, heard, there was some report that was published, a client shared with me, 
they're talking about 400 square feet per person going forwards. And we're now at about 150 to 200 max. So there, there could be the potential, but again, I think uh, memories are short and I think we will be back to normal levels uh, sometime in the, in the future. For sure. Peter. I'm not, and Chris, Chris, I'm not sharing an office with you. <laughs> yeah, <I'm not> either. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for, for, for me, I don't know where this settles. I can tell you a little example. I'm, I'm working on behalf of Fiera Capital, a consolidation of our, our actually our own offices. It's about 50,000 square feet in downtown Toronto. And so we're designing our space right now as we speak. And so I went to, I went to our president and said, okay, do you want to uh, get more space or do you want to get less space because more people are working from home? And the answer was, for right now, let's, you know, we can't plan a 10 year lease based on this event that, that may be only a year. Um, but what we are, so, so no change in the actual square footage we're taking because of those two counterbalancing forces. But what we are doing is we're designing the furniture differently. So maybe before we had two, um, you know, desks that face each other. Um, now they're kind of offset so that people aren't face to face with each other. Um, those kind of tweaks, um, I think will be more kind of the cosmetic furniture changes that may be impacted by, by this event versus the square footage. Excellent. Chris, your opinion. So, you know, nobody knows, but if we look at history, I think it'll balance out. It'll be a little of this, a little of that, and a little of this. Um, so I, I would agree with Colin and, and Peter, and I suspect John's going to kind of similarly agree. Um, also, a vaccine will change everything. If a vaccine came along tomorrow, people will have short memories and say we can sit closer together again. And, and so I'm not sure it'll be one size fits all for everything. And that's generally the way it is. One size does not fit all. Some companies will go this, some companies will do that. Um, and for the short term, the solution is going to be work from home because the pipe, the, the problem isn't at the office. The problem is getting to the office. I firmly believe that. If you take one third of your staff and say, come in on Monday, Tuesday, and the other third come in Wednesday and Thursday, uh, Wednesday and, and Thursday, and then the last third come in on Friday, you've done your social distancing in the office, but you got to make sure they can get there safely. So it's about staff feeling safe. Um, I think, and I suspect people will take their time and be thoughtful about it. And it's interesting what, what Peter said, um, and they'll be respectful about it for their people. So letting people stay home for a little longer until we feel completely safe. Um, Long-term decisions generally made on a knee-jerk reaction or on a moment in time generally don't fare well. So I think thoughtful and respectful reflection will be what most people will look to before they start ripping their office apart, changing this, changing that, other than the short-term immediate make people safe and make them feel safe. Thanks, Chris. John, I assume you agree with most of what's been said or? Yes, yeah, so I don't think people are in a position to make long-term decisions. There's just too many unknowns. So you're gonna sit, you're gonna watch how it evolves. Uh, I think people are gonna be practical. Uh, so much of what was said here, I completely agree with. Um, you know, I, I think that I, I will mention one thing. There was a study that we just did in the US and it's, it will come out in Canada. 71% of tenants are saying that they would prefer to work at home one day a week uh, as needed, not necessarily a planned event every, every week, but they're finding it's a better work-life balance. And I think most businesses will probably accommodate something like that. Uh, so I think it might change a little bit of the dynamic, but you still need space to go to, even if they do come back to it. Um, I, I, what we've heard on the retail side is over 50% of the retail tenants are saying they will develop an omni, omni channel strategy now going forward. Mm -hmm. That was a big shift. Uh, it was a very big, big shift. And I do think we'll see significant shifts in retail. Um, and we haven't seen much of any difference on the industrial side. Perfect. Thanks, John. Thank you to my panel. That concludes our discussion today as we're out of time and actually a little over time. Um, but again, I want to thank everybody, uh, panel members, and those of you joining us on the other side of this video call. I hope you enjoyed listening to our panel members. And again, if there are any follow-up questions that you have, please feel free to reach out to myself or our panel members. We'll do our best to get back to you in a timely fashion. 
And above all else, stay healthy. We'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.